Thanks, Ralph. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. It's quite exciting to be here. Um, let's talk about how we tried to adopt, how we did indeed, uh, a DevOps culture at Porsche, and how GitLab helped us on getting there. But first things first, uh, this is who we are. Here with me is Dennis. Um, I am Alberto. We are both software engineers. We work for Smart Mobility at Porsche. And for those of you not familiar with the company, well, here are some figures. Um, we are quite a lot of people, and to be honest, we are not a software company. I guess you already figured it out. Um, but in the recent years, um, IT and smart mobility are becoming one of our main pillars. And the company is really um, committed on developing further those businesses. So indeed, what is it that we do? Um, well, nice cars, <laughs> but not only. And in particular, this one, um, it really represents a lot to us. It was a real game changer for us. Um, together with this vehicle, which is our first electric vehicle, um, Porsche committed on part of developing and really investing a lot of resources on building up a portfolio of digital services. And not only worrying about making nice cars, but also fulfilling the experience of our customers with additional digital services. So what are these digital services? So for instance, one of our latest ones is Apple Music integration in your car. So you need your phone to play your music. Or phone applications that allow you to honk and flash or unlock your car, check the battery level. Um, we also have a lot of um, other type of businesses and services, such as Porsche Drive and Passport. Um, these are sharing and subscription services that allow you to drive Porsches even not owning them. Um, and also things that are not so visible for end customers but equally needed for making all these products be where they are, uh, such as our Gravity platform. This is our microservices platform, and it's where Dennis and I work most of our time. So, so far, so cool, right? I mean, just um, cool stuff. Uh, and, and why there is a story? Well, the truth is, it wasn't always like this. Um, there was a time in which it was really painful to, to, to work on these products, because the setup that we had in place didn't really cope with our needs. Um, so software development at Porsche didn't start a few years ago when we committed on developing these digital services. Software development existed for a while, and we had after sales systems, we had production systems, we had HR systems, a lot of things coming from a big company, I guess you can relate. And asking for these needs, uh, there was a central department taking care of all these things. So they looked, and they said, let's set up an infrastructure for, this infrastructure for all these projects, let's set up a code repository, let's set up a build tool, let's make everything for them, taking care of their needs. And they did so. So they, f they built the whole infrastructure and a whole solution based on the existing needs for um, like some years ago, or what you would understand as traditional software development. Then what happened? Um, well, indeed, there was nothing wrong with this, right? I mean, it worked for a while, and for these projects and for these teams, it was enough. Um, but then software development started changing, and people like us started joining the company, and we started going into new businesses, such as the digital services I talk about. Um, and so teams started popping up, and we came with nice ideas, um, new requirements. We wanted to go to the cloud. We didn't want to deploy on-prem. Um, we had different ways of thinking how the artifacts should be built and what, what, were our, what were our requirements with regards to the build tools and so on. So the thing is, we came back to this IT department and we said, hey, we have these needs, um, so how can we do it? And then this happened, conflict. Of course, they were not prepared for that many teams coming asking new things, and we quickly ended up in a burden trap um, that basically led us to just frustration, poor performance, and we basically were investing most of our time in fighting against this traditional department that were reluctant to change rather than focusing on our products and our services. So just to make you a bit more of detail on how did it look, this is a very simple diagram of our infrastructure. And on the right, you'll see our Gravity platform. It's a micro, the microservices platform that I talked about before. And then on the left, it was the CICD build code repository um, setup that we had on-prem. One of the problems we had, for instance, were availability. They were going down at least twice a week. And it would take even half an hour to go up again. 
we had a very limited set of agents for running our compilations and our builds. And that wasn't the only problem. <laughs> it was also each of the agents were differently configured. So you were not sure whether if your build will, was going to be successful or not, depending on the agent that was picked. Um, we didn't have any admin permissions for configuring it as well. So we, we basically were sold. On top of that, we wanted to deploy on a cloud platform from an on-prem infrastructure. And we were forced to go through a reverse proxy that also had a lot of performance and av availability issues. So basically, we said, this is not the scaling. This will eventually kill us. We cannot give proper services to our customers with this setup. So what is it that we did? We looked around. And we looked around and we thought, it cannot be that we are the only ones at Porsche, such a big company, having these problems. Um, but the thing is, we looked around and we couldn't find any other team that did something different. They were all accepting the troubles and living with them. So we didn't want to do that, and we decided to build it ourselves. And of course, we didn't build yet another CI CD tool, uh, but we decided to set it ourselves. So um, Dennis, I, and some other colleagues, we sat together, and we started thinking how the solution should look like. And we started saying we want to promote um, collaboration between teams. Because in the past, with the previous infrastructure and with this IT department being in control of all the repositories, there was no collaboration between teams. And we thought that in order to make the company successful in digital services, that was one of the main key features that we had to achieve. We wanted also a reduction of toolings because we had a set of tools, each of them for a very specific need, but we felt that they were not properly integrated with each other. Um, there were some logins that were not shared, and it was painful to use as well. We wanted to set up an open source um, concept in or like approach at the company, but the truth is, and I guess you figure it out as well, we are a very traditional company, we are very big, so going to open source takes time. At least what we achieved is getting into an e source model, and now currently, unless someone is really against that or there are some confidentiality uh, aspects that we don't take into account, all people can check some other team's code, which is pretty cool. We wanted to have a single source of truth. We didn't, go to, we didn't want to go to different tools to check whether who committed what or when was deployed or what was the version or what was the agent running what. And also wanted the status builds because, well, as you remember, with the problem with the agents, we got differently configured agents, we got irreproducible builds, we got some random behavior that we could not control. So stateless builds was basically answered that problem that we had. And then as well, we were tired of seeing people clicking through UIs for configuring the builds. We thought that wasn't scalable. Whenever you had to create yet another project, you couldn't look to a code uh, or to a file and kind of get ideas from it, but you had to go to a web UI and eventually miss a checkbox and yeah, that was a mess. So with this set of features, we yet again looked around. And this time, we did find uh, what we thought it was a really good fit. And that's basically the beginning of the story of how we jumped into GitLab. Now I pass the word to Dennis, which will tell you how we did it. Yeah, thank you very much, Alberto. Um, yeah, now that we know um, why we had to act and what we had to do, um, we again looked around and said, OK, we want to use GitLab, but we don't really want to operate it on ourselves. That's why we searched for some hosters, and we came up with gitlabhost.com. And I think they're also here in the audience today, uh, today. And props to them. They're doing a really nice job. And what we did in the beginning was just setting up a plain instance with a static set of runners and just playing around with it. So we, we just took a, a relatively easy or um, simple project and migrated to GitLab and tried to get used to the um, concept of GitLab. And that went really well. It was really nice for us. And we then soon started um, to migrate all our core projects there, our, our platform projects. And also, we got a high demand from the external projects which um, are building those um, apps or services you've seen um, at Alberto's um, presentation. And it was a really nice experience for us. So then, afterwards, we, we opened 
this instance up for, for the project. And we quickly realized that we can't build another silo system. So we had to somehow think about how can we integrate GitLab with the existing on-prem infrastructure and um, talk to the guys which operate the infrastructure uh, on-prem and got a really nice solution to integrate um, their IDP. So we provided a single sign-on for GitLab and we don't have to mess with user management, creating users, deleting users. It was all like given to us. And we also um, enabled repository mirroring. So all the projects could just try out and still use the old um, tooling they had. And it was really smooth. I mean, for, for us, it was done in like one to two weeks with about 10 projects. And the feedback from, from the external third party project was, was amazing. And then after more and more people um, came to the, to the GitLab instance, um, we quickly realized it really makes a lot of sense to think about how can we share tooling because our tech landscape, as we've seen before, is based on Cloud Foundry and most of the projects use Java and Spring Boot and that's why it was really um, beneficial that we introduced some shared build images and thereby also shared scripts so everyone could um, participate. And that was the first occasion where we really um, could enable this idea of having an inner source model and fostering collaboration. And it really worked out nicely because every day an another project came and say, ah, we want to have this. Can we build it? And we just said, PRs, welcome. And they did it. <laughs> it was really nice. Um, afterwards, um, more and more projects joined. Um, and we really invest invested a lot of time into infrastructure automation and user creation and providing technical users, all that stuff. And we heavily invested in automating all our infrastructure. So um, we came up with an idea that we just provide a configuration file for a project which fill in their data. And then everything is set up automatically. Then a build job on um, GitLab is triggered and all the space creation on Cloud Foundry is done, all the permissions are set up. Also, um, we use the GitLab API to register some secrets to enable them to directly deploy to their respective um, infrastructure. And it was really, really beneficial for us and we saved a lot of work and time there. And then the, the big requirement came across um, to deploy globally. Um, maybe you know, China is the biggest market for us and we started in Europe, which was quite easy. But then we also got this requirement to deploy to China. And that really changed the game for us because we had to think about how can we enable multi-regional deployment within, from one project, how can we parallelize that and how can we avoid having too many path dependencies between regional deployments. And um, we came up with a really nice solution to trigger the project on its own to have parallelized pipelines which deploy to different regions and it works really good. And thereby we adopted more and more GitLab CI features like different pipeline triggers, all the different uh, conditions you can uh, set up there and also more uh, use the GitLab API, which is really good. And then we set up our multi-regional deployment, but then the greater firewall came around the corner um, because when you try to deploy an artifact with like 30 megs of size to China, it could take hours if it goes through. So it was a huge problem for us um, but we could manage it somehow by doing night shifts and trying to deploy and then um, leveraging the Cloud Foundry caching mechanisms. But for the project, it, it didn't work. So we had to think about how can we transfer data reliably to China. And we tried a lot and we wanted to avoid setting up a different or a parallel GitLab instance there. 
because all the Chinese colleagues are also collaborating and working with us in our European instance, and that works quite good. Um, and then we came up with the idea that we just transfer the source code and set up some dedicated runners there, which worked out of the box. It was quite challenging to set up the infrastructure there, but when you have it, um, it really works nice when you um, have a central instance, even in Europe, and then talking to the agents in China. And also what happened, more and more people, again, um, all the time joining the instance, and we really run into high queue times for runners to pick up build jobs, even sometimes 20, 30 minutes, um, especially when a sprint is ending for certain projects. And thereby we set up an auto-scaled runner cluster in AWS, which enabled us to have sort of infinite runners, depending on if we are willing to pay for the compute resources. So, and this is what it looks now. It's not completely different. You can still see the on-prem infrastructure, which is used, for instance, as IDP. We still use um, steady code analysis tools from on-prem infrastructure, artifact store and issue tracker. Um, but the cool thing is we have our central instance in Frankfurt and set up this um, environment of runners for the European region to deploy to the European gravity instance and also the um, connected runners in China, which enable us to deploy easily within China. So let's talk about some results. These are the components we are heavily adopted. Um, we use this GitLab instance for one year now, and one really nice feature is the permissions model to set up a group structure and share secrets and share permissions. And also, uh, what's really nice to give an expiry for the permissions, uh, because oftentimes we have changing personnel and it's really nice to, to have this permission model. Also, we store all our source code within GitLab. Um, we built everything in GitLab. We completely use that um, feature. We do code reviews in GitLab. And also, we heavily use the release features, such as uh, defining the environments so that we can centrally see which version of which software is deployed where and on which stage. And we also use um, a little bit of infrastructure automation for the, for the runner setup and also for um, setting up some settings on, on GitLab itself. And here are some hard facts. Um, as I said, we have this instance for one year now. Um, we came up with more than 660 repositories, more than 250 active users, which means active developers, not just registered project managers. Um, we also have this feature of infinite runners, which really um, spe sped up our um, build jobs. And more than 80K pipelines are triggered until today, or have been triggered. And these are the features we would really like to adopt in the near future. Um, so to also track issues within GitLab, to have this feature to measure cycle time reliably and conveniently, which we can't do right now that easily. Also getting rid of our on-prem artifactory or package management tool and using GitLab. And we are especially looking forward for the um, dependency firewall feature and then maybe adopt it, hopefully. And um, for the secure and monitoring part, it all comes down again to integration, like not having an additional tool for monitoring your services. And for the secure, we really would like to use the static um, security and code analysis um, features of GitLab, but they are unfortunately behind the ultimate paywall, and we just have premium, so maybe we can talk later. <laughs> and yeah, that's it. If you have questions or anything else, just come to us. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>